I'm Melissa Nielsen, and a welcome to 2023. Parenting and homeschooling can feel like a large feat to take on. Melissa Nielsen is here sharing her 26 years experience to help us. Melissa will inspire you with foundations for early childhood, Waldorf curriculum by the grade, middle school and high school resources, planning for peace, form drawing, beeswax modeling, wet on wet painting, inner work, temperaments, music, handwork, festivals, eurythmy, circle time, creating a co-op, homeschooling multiple children, conscious parenting, special needs, peaceful bedtime, and much more. We're going to be doing our podcast in a like a two-piece format. So the first piece will be here on YouTube or on the um, podcast platform where you can listen to it for free. And the second piece, which is a deeper piece, a little more like going behind the scenes with Melissa a little bit. How do I actually apply these things in my life? And sometimes some juicier content. That is going to be available on our Patreon. Hi there. If you don't already know me, I'm Melissa Nielsen with Waldorf Essentials. And I wanted to talk to you today about the way we teach reading in Waldorf. Now, I really should call this the way Melissa teaches Waldorf reading because I do things a little bit differently than some other people. I've had people recently say to me, Melissa, I love the way you're doing things, but I heard somebody over here wrote in this book or X, Y, and Z that's a little bit different or or we're really pushing my child to read. What do you think about that? So I thought I would break down today just sort of what my process is and my thought process behind it how it links up with Steiner. And then in the second part of our podcast, it's available over for our patrons over on Patreon. I'm going to like dive into deep specifics and, you know, sort of what we use, how we use it and that sort of thing. So first, I just want to welcome you. And I, I'm just really excited to have you here listening to me today. And if you're listening to us on the podcast versus um, a video, you know, you'll want to make sure that you check out the links that are on the podcast uh, section on our website so that you will be able to have all the links that we talk about and all the, the pieces that we talk about today in this podcast. So let's dive in. Um, I have taught myself, I have five children and I've taught each one of them to read in this manner, in this fashion. And my children are all over the place with regards to some of them have special needs, some of them don't. Um, out of five children, I have two that are on the spectrum, two that have ADHD that are not the ones that are on the spectrum. And I have one that's neurotypical. My child that's neurotypical is phlegmatic. So he's super pokey and slow, or he was at that point in time. So I want to give you a broad picture of sort of what it is like or what you can expect as you're teaching each child to read within their own temperament. So if you are new to temperament study, I encourage you to jump over to some of our other podcasts and really get to know your child's temperament. It will help you so much when you are teaching them. So, so, so much. So let's start with like what my goal is in teaching reading. So when we start first grade um, in the Waldorf curriculum, we are assuming that they don't have any other, you know, they, they're not, their background isn't, oh, I've been reading or mom's been coaching me with a hundred easy lessons or anything like that. We are starting with a clean slate. Um, if that is not the case for you, it is okay. But really my goal when we're teaching reading is not just reading. It is to create a strong connection with the written word. So it, it doesn't help if we teach a child to read and yeah, they read, but they hate reading, right? And, and, and a lot of that is temperament, but also a lot of that is how they learn to read and how they, it was brought to them and sort of how it, um, sorry, I'm going to turn my bingers off here. They got all kinds of messages coming in. All right, there we go. But it's a lot of like how they learn to read and how they took that in. So if it was a super negative experience, they're not so likely to be excited to pick up a book. So we want to really sort of level that playing field. When you are teaching a child to read, you need to have your shiznit in order. So if you are in a bad mood, Try not to attempt it on that, that day. Get yourself in a great place. Know that they are going to require more of you in these reading lessons than some of their other main lesson work. Like that, 
I, I get the most fearful messages about teaching class one, As, especially my parents that don't have, they, my, their child's not reading. They've been super dreaming. Oh no, how's it going to go? Well, I'm telling you, I'm giving you a formula. So if you take notes while you're listening to me, pause and go back and listen some more, and you do what I say, you will have success. Very rarely, and I'm saying this to you, I like, I can hear now all the, but, but my child is this and my child is that. Listen, very rarely is this an issue. I've worked with thousands of parents, even parents of dyslexic children. And I have dyslexia. So I want to tell you, like, I had somebody yesterday on a post that I made. They were like, do you even know what you're talking about? I'm like, yes, actually, I identify this way. This is, it was a, it was a post about ADHD. And I, you know, I, I'm like right there. I can totally identify with those, those places. So I have dyslexia and I can tell you how it showed up for me as a child, the challenges that it gave me. And then also I think it really helps me be a better teacher. It helps me really think about my children, where they each are and what their different perspectives are and their temperaments are when we're, when we're approaching reading. So I just want you to know that even if your child has got some of these challenges, I would still use these methods because what happens is when, if you say, say you, you do all the things that we say, and then you go to a coach that, you know, you're, say you're really, you're, you've got, you've done all the things that we recommend. And then you go, you find a, um, you know, a reading specialist that, that works with dyslexia or children that have reading challenges. The first thing they're going to ask you is, have you done this, 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 and this? And you're going to be able to say, yes, I have. So we want you to actually take this journey, even if you suspect something else is going on with your child, because this journey is the journey that they're going to require of you or request of you. I also want to say before I start talking about, um, you know, making sure you have a lot of uh, plenty of practice time is if you think my practice time is excessive and you have a child that is struggling you are going to have way more practice time put on you when you have a dyslexia or um, reading specialist then, because they're going to tell you to do these exact same things. They're going to tell you to really work with these pieces. So I just want to tell you, as I'm diving in here, I've heard it all. I've heard it all. And I want to really help you start off in a beautiful, beautiful way so that you're centered, your child is, is enjoying this process. And even though there are challenges that you get through to the other side, because once you get through to the other side, it's kind of magical. Now in the Waldorf school setting, it is not the goal of first grade for them to be able to read. It's not their goal. And, and that's okay. That's, it's a, a different situation, but in the homeschool setting, in the homeschool setting. So talking to as a homeschooler, the minute your child can read, the easier your job becomes, especially if you have several children. So we really want to work with a very beautiful, organic way that still follows Steiner, but allows there to be space for reading at the end of first grade. And I'm not saying at the beginning of first grade or even in the middle of first grade, but by the end of first grade, we really want to sort of have that goal for you and still have that strong connection to the written word for your child. Okay. So hopefully you're still with me. We're going to just break it down here. And like I said, in this first part, I'm going to break it down and then I'm going to go even deeper in the part two for our friends over at Patreon. Um, and that's really easy to join. You can um, grab us on Patreon. It's under Ariel's light at Patreon, A U R. I-E-L apostrophe S light. Ariel's light is our nonprofit. And so everything that goes through Patreon um, helps support our nonprofit, which is really all about connecting parents and children and in this, you know, beautiful conscious parenting way. So let's dive in. Um, again, Steiner would do it a little bit differently. The goal of first grade is generally not not about reading. They they bring the letters, of course, but often in a Waldorf school setting, we're looking at, you know, reading fluency is probably second, sometimes even third grade. A lot of children aren't like fully seated until they are in class three. And, you know, I want to say that's okay, even for the homeschooler, because if you're listening to this and you're like, but my kid doesn't read and we're nine or we're 10, it's okay. Listen anyway, because 
the, the, the things that we're going to be talking about will totally work with the older child. Um, the story content will be different, but the things that we're talking about here, you can absolutely do with an older child. So we are working with children that are seven or nearly seven. I'm not talking to you about a four-year-old, a five-year-old, or even a new six-year-old. I am talking about children that are seven or nearly seven. So that means that they will be seven in the Northern Hemisphere. If, you, if you're schooling in the Northern Hemisphere, that means they're ready for first grade if they are seven before March 31. That is not an arbitrary time. I know that there are Walder settings and Walder schools where they're like, oh, of course, it's okay if they go up till June. It's actually not. Um, and I'm I'm pretty strong about this because, you know, we we really want the child to be fully ready to take the next step of their development. And they're not before that. You will be super frustrated. Does that mean that you can't teach a child that's younger to read? Of course, it doesn't mean that doesn't mean that at all. And there are going to be children, you know, often children that are on the spectrum or have something else going that they're like hyper-focused in that space. And they, it's all like they came out of the womb reading. And so it's totally okay. If that happened, it's not ideal. It's not what we're pushing for. And I would absolutely never teach a younger child to read. doesn't matter how much they beg. I would find something else for them to do. We would do music. We would maybe do some very easy forms, not for a four-year-old, talking about a six-year-old here, but we would not dive into this process that I'm going to explain to you until they are seven or nearly seven. So if you are listening to this and you have a four-year-old, either save this for later or please don't employ it right now because you know there, there's something that happens and it it often happens when we're with the first child, our, you know, it's our first child or, or maybe our only child. And we're just super excited for all of these stages. And guess what? Don't be in a rush. Just take a break, take a breath and take it slow because you only get to experience learning to read one time, just one time. And you only get to experience teaching this child to read or leading them to reading one time. So let's make the, let's make the things that, you know, will help that as optimal as possible. We want to make all of those, those pieces. We want, we want you to like succeed. We don't want you to be in a spot where you're feeling like <laughs> all of the odds are against you. So we're going to work with the child that is seven or nearly seven. They're developmentally ready. We are doing some writing um, and some forms before reading. So, you know, in our curriculum, we're definitely starting with some forms in week one. Most children that, and this is our curriculum, by the way, for those of you who are watching us on video, this is our class one curriculum. And we have these like awesome cards that I'll talk a little bit about here in a few minutes. But, um, you know, you're, you're bringing children to uh, writing and reading that probably have been practicing their writing skills. And that's totally okay. If they're, if they're four years old and they're writing, it does not mean they're ready to read. I promise. I promise. Just let them unfold. Don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry. Let them unfold. So, um, you know, you, you've got children now more than a hundred years ago, you know, a hundred years ago when Steiner laid out a lot of indications Children weren't, they weren't seeing signs every day because they weren't in a car every day. They weren't so, unless you've lived on a homestead and your child hasn't been off the homestead very much, your child has likely been to the grocery store, on the freeway, all of those things where they're seeing signs everywhere. They're seeing letters come at them everywhere. You are, they are seeing all of these things on a fairly regular basis. And so, you know, you're really, um, you're really having to take those indications and modernize them just a bit, but not too much. Like I would not go as far as I see some people go. So honestly, still take a breath and just walk it. So you're going to be doing forms and they're going to be writing before they're reading. Um, people often ask me, do you correct grip and stuff? I correct grip in first grade. I generally don't correct it beforehand. Also in first grade, and this is not about reading, in first grade, they're writing with either a stick crayon, the fat stick crayons, or a thicker pencil. So not, nothing small, no tiny pen or anything like that. That is not what they're writing with in first grade. So fat crayons or thick, the thick, um, like I like the Lyra pencils, 
the ones that are triangular giants, because it's really hard for them to have an incorrect grip with those. So again, writing informs before reading. If you are working through a curriculum, um, and most, I would say most uh, Waldorf class one, you're going to get that. So you're either going to get a block on forms first, or you're going to be doing forms every week. In our curriculum, we start with forms, um, and then we're doing forms every week. And with forms, we're not looking for perfection. We are looking for them to have repetition and to do their best work, but their one child's best work it's not going to be another child's best work. And that's, you know, one of those places where temperament comes in. And so you could have a phlegmatic child that, that just, you can almost feel how watery they are and that they're haphazard in a lot of things. We work every year um, to consolidate that a little bit. So by fourth grade, I'm really doing this great consolidation on, you know, how sloppy things might be or that kind of thing. But I don't say that to a first grader at all. We are just letting them come as they are, but we are reminding them to do their best work. So we're working on these forms before reading. Then when we start to bring the letters, I wouldn't bring any more than two letters a week. Some teachers would say bring one letter a week, but I think that dra really drags it out too long. So I would bring two letters a week. I would bring one letter and a story, work with that letter, draw that letter, draw the picture from the story. Art is so, so important in this process. And then on day two, recall the story, practice the letter some more, and then you keep going. And you're recalling and doing a little summary, but those summaries in class one should be one sentence, not doesn't even have to be a complete sentence, but it's very short. It's very much about helping it like be in their body. You really want them to take it in and really love this content and love the stories. Don't be afraid of the stories. If you are afraid of the stories, go back and listen to our podcast that we did with Miss Tiffany, where we talked all about fairy tales. <laughs> and, and we talked all about like the importance of those and what to do if you need to replace them, that kind of thing. Okay. And then as they are going through and doing two letters per week, by the time you get to the end, and, and again, I don't bring any vowels until the end. So if you're using our curriculum, you'll see that we have like one really long block that brings all the consonants. Then we have a break and we do some mathematics and then we come back and we do the vowels. Why do we do that? When we do that, and again, it's different than the classroom, but we do that because once you have all the letters, then you just need the keys to the words. So as you, as you have all the letter sounds, and you're practicing those sounds every week. So, you know, if you're doing M and V week one, then at the end of week one, you're, you know, you're practicing the sounds for M and V. Week two, as you bring the next two letters, you're going to recall and practice the letters from week one, add the week two letters and then week three and so on. So that you are continually reviewing a lot of review. Now, um, People want to know, like, should I use these cards as review? You can, but I am not a fan of using flashcards the way we had them used when we were in the, the, you know, the 70s and 80s. Like, what is this? No, that is not how I use these. I would put cards like these on the nature table, um, you know, and a nice card holder for the week that we're, uh, that we're bringing the letters those letters specifically. And then after that, I might use them in our review, but not in a quizzing kind of way. So, um, you know, you just want to keep things very fluid in that space. And you're going to get some pushback from most children will probably be like, I mean, even your super compliant children are maybe in a space like I'm tired. I don't want to do anymore. Listen to that. You as the parent know just how far to push them. Don't push them too far. So um, in practice for this age, I generally go with five minutes per year. So practice, that doesn't mean you're, you're reading for 35 minutes in class one, or you're practicing for 35 minutes, but the entire space should be about 35 minutes. So from your writing or practicing letters, and then, you know, uh, reviewing the sounds of them, that should be about 35 minutes. But don't sit and drill them for 35 minutes. It will exhaust them and make them not happy about reading. 
So then again, once you get to the end of all those consonants and you have that little break with your math block, then you would review those consonants, even if they don't remember them all, you're going to review them and then you're going to bring that first vowel sound. So most children are reading the very first day they have been introduced and I just do short vowels. We do short vowels until they get all those short vowels down. And once they start to see the keys, they're like, wait a minute, what? I can do all of this. Then we bring those short vowels and then we keep going. And pretty soon they, once they've exhausted all the short vowels, then you can bring in some other things, but you can do so much with short vowel sounds. And, and I wouldn't rush it. You know, at this point you are probably, gosh, um, about spring or so of class one. And, you know, their, their capacities are changing because they're getting closer to age eight and things are starting to click into place. And again, don't rush it, just allow them to unfold, allow them to unfold, allow that space to be a joyful one. Once you've gotten through um, those short vowel sounds, I encourage you to get some great readers. I really love the Shelley David Owl readers. They are, you know, just beautiful. I'm going to share my screen here so you can see. I really like these readers for a start. They are great. They are great for introducing your children to that first space of reading. So that would be my recommendation. And then, um, you know, they, they grow with them too. So there are six books in that set. I would start with book one and we read book one until we don't need to read book one anymore. And then the same with book two, don't be in a rush, but I will say, if you have a child that is a little pokey, give them a goal or come up with a goal together. So, you know, we, we went through this process with my um, child number four. I love to pieces like he would walk through fire for me and I would the same for him. Um, he's a teenager as we're recording this and I, and like such a joyful phlegmatic, all of my children are joyful in, in so many ways. But, you know, when we were in this space and he was in that pokey space and he was sort of like, I thought, are we ever getting through this book? Come on, we can do it. What helped was a goal. So I said, so is there something you want to read that you can't read yet? And he picked a book out that was like, you know, sixth or eighth grade level reading. He said, this is what I want to read. And I said, all right, sweetheart, we are not going to get there by taking our time like this. We have got to really work harder. And, and that was what he needed. He had this incentive then. And, and what's funny is he never actually ended up going and reading the book, but he read many, many other things. So it was about that little bit of incentive. So talk to your child. Is there something that they want, something special they want to do once they've mastered some of this and really have a good time with it? I am definitely not somebody who is constantly about rewards, but some children, depending on their temperament, need a little bit of incentive. And the incentive is sometimes needs to be a little bit more than reading itself. So have fun with this. I want to encourage you to just really enjoy your children in the space and not stress, not stress about whether or not they are getting it and just keep walking. Now, the question often comes, well, at what point do you worry? I generally do not worry unless we are like nine, 10 years old and they have zero interest and nothing is sticking. But it will not just be in reading that you're going to see that. You're going to see that in other places. You'll see it probably with some mathematics not, not sticking, or you'll see it in some other memory challenges. So, you know, look at the whole picture. Don't just look at where they are in math. If they are challenged with math, but they're doing great in every other area, you know, their movement is great. They've got great coordination. Then it just might be how they're unfolding. And I know that society tells us that we have to be so stressed and early intervention is so important and all of this and all of that. But truly, I'm telling you, as a Waldorf parent of more than 20 years, teaching my own five to read, helping thousands of families teach their children to read, society often tells us to worry when we don't need to worry. So really take your time. 
take a breath. If you are wanting some extra help and you'd like um, somebody from our team to help you, please feel like you can come to office hours. So we have um, office hours. Check it out on our website over at WaldorfEssentials.com. Drop one of us a note and we can give you all the information on how to join us for office hours. So thank you so much for joining me today. If you want to go deeper with us, hop over to Patreon, catch the rest of um, our podcasts there, and we will see you next time. Find our Patreon at Ariel's Light. So Ariel's Light, if you haven't heard already, is the ministry that we started this year. Interfaith, so we welcome people of all faiths to come and and experience and, and converse and really get to know this conscious parenting space. I, I see it as a space for people that might be deeply into the religion, like being able to go deeper in what that parent-child relationship means. And then people that are just trying to figure out like, what does this inner work journey mean to me? Or in that space, and I've been there, <laughs> trying to figure out, well, how do I bring what's welling up inside me to my children so that they aren't lost in confusion, so that they actually have this piece of goodness and beauty that Steiner always talks about. So the ministry has um, roots of anthroposophy and we will be talking about things from an anthroposophical standpoint, but also really bringing you good content that you can bring into your life 